Hello everyone and uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being uh, with us today in this webinar organized by School Education Gateway. Uh, the initiative of the European Union and the place to engage with European policy and practice for early childhood and school education. My name is Marta and I'm very happy to support this webinar with my colleague Eleonora in the backstage. Today's focus is uh, non-formal learning and online school education. This webinar offers you a comparative overview of formal, non-formal and informal learning theories in terms of purpose, timing, content, delivery systems, control and evaluation. The presentation provides practical examples of non-formal learning methods that can be used in classroom, in a museum hall within the Erasmus Plus project or at a distance. Mariana Ancuta, our speaker today, is an expert and Erasmus Plus trainer in social educational animation within the national network of trainers of the Romanian National Agency. Currently, is coordinating a project on sustainable development education European network in the European network for the promotion of a responsible economy. So this is our agenda for today. Uh, some more practical information for the participants. This webinar is recorded and the recording will be available after, afterwards on the U YouTube channel and on the webinar page. And if you have questions, please post them in the chat and we will address them at the end of the webinar. But without further ado, I'm very happy to give you the floor, Marian, if you are ready. The floor is yours. Thank you. I like this expression. I don't know if it, the meaning it changed for the online. The floor is yours. The microphone is yours or the window is, is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm very glad to be to uh, this activity, to this event. And uh, I would like to thank to all that decided to take uh, an hour from their time to actively say even we'll talk about what it means to be actively uh, involved or to actively participate to uh, online activities. Uh, I will uh, start sharing the presentation because we have a presentation about non-formal. Uh, let's say I. I will warn you that it will seem a bit uh, theoretical, but it's good to have a base of a theoretical base in order to go to the next step to feel uh, how to say comfortable with uh, what it means non formal uh, education or non formal uh, learning. Uh, I will up start and find the presentation. I hope it's working very well on the screen. Oh, I will just get starting here. It's good that we start with seeing all these um, Google products. So already in the presentation, you, you have seen that we have uh, actually two concepts, the concept of uh, learning and the concept of uh, education. Uh, if you studied and if you read some articles lately, I just discovered that there are uh, very uh, well theoretical differences between uh, the two of them, but will not insist today. Uh, yeah, I, I rediscovered, I remembered from my uh, faculty when I had done my uh, bachelor, the beautiful definition uh, about education of uh, Aristotle. So please, if you have the time, as most of the people probably you are teachers, educators or trainers, yes, please uh, go and look for this wonderful definition about uh, of, of education of Aristotle. So today, uh, the structure, first it will be, I told you, these uh, learning theories, uh, then uh, in the second part, uh, we'll try also to, to tackle this online, offline, blended learning, something that we all are living for the last, uh, for the last years of being teachers, being the, the students. Uh, some platforms and some methods, there will be, a, let's say, a more or less, I'm pretty sure that all the educators, the teachers discovered, I would say, even too many platforms or, or applications, but at some point we have to stop and to work with 
three or four or none more. Otherwise, it will be impossible to keep the pace with everything that is uh, invented. In the, in, uh, yes, it's on the online world. And then the, the conclusions after this presentation. Of course, there will be some time for uh, questions. I thought um, for today not to start directly with some uh, theoretical uh, theoretical insights, but to do almost like a, let's imagine we we had been. Uh, what if we uh, what if we had been in an in-person activity, so face to face, in a, and there to think, uh, what would be the first uh, activity that an educator or a teacher would propose for his students or for the participants? Yeah, normally I'm pretty sure if you are familiar with the non-formal uh, learning, non-formal education contexts, right away you would think about an ice-breaking game or about an energizer or uh, why not a name game or getting to know each other. Yeah, I just put here, it's it's an idea, it's an exercise to, to introduce uh, ourselves using this method that most of you I hope you are using the creative writing there are at least let's say I uh, there are manuals and tickets on creative uh, writing and there are over 100 exercises that are helping uh, people to express themselves in different situations now it was just for the introductory yes to think that normally in a non-formal context, now we would have done an ice-breaking game, yes, or a name exercise, even a, an, in a couple of minutes, a trust-building exercise. So uh, we'll not talk only about non-formal education, but we'll uh, be, uh, while mirroring non-formal, formal and informal, there are these three um, let's say, uh, concepts, very much they are used and the people that are involved and uh, already participated to uh, Erasmus Plus projects, or I would say the, the older uh, programs uh, before Erasmus Plus, yes, it was uh, Comenius, Grundvik, yes, use in action. So they are, let's say, more familiar with these uh, three concepts because they are very used in the projects, in the Erasmus Plus projects nowadays, yeah? So we will try to see also the differences and that will be uh, helpful uh, for us because when we are preparing an activity, actually, even we'll see the differences and the similarities between the, the three forms of education, we'll see that in an activity, educational activity, they are mixing very well each other. Yeah, and uh, I will try to um, to keep in mind because we'll talk a, a lot today about the classics of uh, uh, theories of education, and one of the theories that we all are uh, working with is the the attention curve. Yes, even if we are on an offline event, face to face, in person or in online, they say that the first 10 or 15 minutes are the ones when the attention is at the highest level. After 15 minutes, the attention starts to, to decrease. But I will try to remember that in order that after 15 minutes to propose an exercise, yes, or at least a very small break, especially in online contexts, breaks are really very important and we shouldn't forget, forget about it, yeah? Either it's a break just for a glass of water or a breathing fresh air, breaks are important. We'll try not to forget, even if there is lots of information. I'm, I'm starting with the, um, a question like if you ever thought that people have stereotypes about non-formal education or about non-formal learning. So what could be the stereotypes? 
I wouldn't go to call it prejudices, but stereotypes about non-formal education. And I uh, heard some stereotypes about non-formal education uh, directly. So people were saying, ah, so you are doing non-formal um, education activities. That means you are playing all the time or uh, that means you are not so serious in your activities. This is not real learning or this is not real education, non-formal. And why? Because it's, it sounds like being the opposite or even the, uh, yes, not so uh, friend with the formal education. So if it's not in school, if it's not happening in school, uh, maybe it's not uh, that serious. And here I put some of these uh, stereotypes and we are going to discover together if it's true or not. Is it non-formal education uh, serious or less serious than the formal one? I was thinking that we should start from the, let's say from the beginnings of uh, pedagogy or, or of the learning theorists, yes? And even if now we, we talk only about formal, non-formal, informal education or learning, well, there is uh, lots of literature behind, yeah, very connected with the characteristics of uh, formal, non-formal, informal. They started with the um, behaviorists, with cognitivists, with humanists, social and situational. And normally, if we, we don't really have the time to, to go uh, in depth to analyze each of these learning theories, but you'll see that in the um, characteristics of uh, informal, non-formal and uh, formal, we'll find a lot, something from cognitivist. Yes, maybe when we'll talk about um, formal education, we'll see there are lots of characteristics of uh, the theory of cognitivists. Or when we'll talk about uh, non-formal education, you'll see that maybe it's closer to the humanist or to the social and situational, yes, theory of education. Uh, I'm sure and I hope you are already familiar with these theories of education and learning, but it's good that not to forget that these are the, let's say, the basis when we discuss the theory of education or of, of learning, yeah? and. Uh, all these aspects related with um, the purpose in education or the educator's role, uh, we are going to see it also in the three forms of education that we'll discuss today, meaning formal, non-formal and informal. Now, this is, let's say, the, the most simple or the simplest, if you want, definition of, of learning, acquiring or improving we all are, are used with this scheme, uh, KSA, yes, knowledge, skills, attitudes. And also coming back to the classics, yes, to the theorists, depends on the way how we see the, the learning. Is it a product, yes, or is it the process? What is more important when we deal with, with the learning? Now, uh, already uh, we have the uh, definition of formal education, let's say it's very easy to identify, to place it actually, yeah, because it's very easy to, to find there is an institution, yes, and when you say formal education, even when you say education, automatically, by default, I think it will be in the first three or four words, you can try this exercise, people will say school, or people will say teachers, or people will say grades, yeah? or people will say uh, diplomas, certificates, recognition. So there are uh, lots of um, features, adjectives that we can use uh, when we want to really uh, know what is this formal education. Doesn't matter if we refer to gymnasium, uh, primary or to PhD, yes, to bachelor, uh, to master of arts. So there are different degrees and we can see very clearly here 
and I can tell you it's it's a definition coming from the from the years of uh, from 74. So it's not a new definition, but it still has um, its sense. Now coming to non-formal education, uh, what is interesting and sometimes surprising for people when, uh, especially for the ones that we were talking, having some uh, stereotypes, is when they see that non-formal education, it's an organized activity. So it's not like uh, we are meeting outside on the playground and we say, let's make a game and that we can consider it non-formal education. Uh, not at all. So it is an organized activity. Uh, there are all the time the, the learning objectives, there is a purpose, there is even a process. Yes, so all the characteristics of an educational process are also uh, available for the non-formal education. It was one of the stereotype, we'll see if it's a stereotype that is more participatory. Yes, or it's um, voluntary based. Now, if you are asking very uh, quickly uh, where we can put this uh, webinar, is it formal or is it non-formal? I will not answer this question until we see also the definition of uh, informal education. Yeah, because people are, mm, let's say if we heard and especially in the Erasmus Plus a lot about non-formal education methods, non-formal uh, education tools, non-formal education techniques, about informal no, we don't talk too much so it's not tackled yeah but it's good to keep in mind that we have also this informal education is the main difference that we don't have the word it's not organized here so if we put also if we can use uh, conscious or unconscious uh, learning process or deliberate or incidental about the informal education we can say that it's incidental yes it's not organized it's not planned so it can happen that we learn things from anyone at some point on the on the street even if we didn't plan for it yeah or from work or from our colleagues from let's call it like this from the informal moments yes from uh, informal uh, meetings informal uh, gatherings that we have and it's true that we don't take all the all the time for example to reflect uh, what did i learn today or did i meet uh, someone that I learned something from, but could be a very nice uh, question at the end of the day, but that would mean that we are interfering in this informal education like by planning or yes. Now to see the whole three forms of education yeah, and maybe uh, it's very uh, shortly the definitions. We said formal education schools, training institutions, yes, organized. Non-formal uh, is more connected with the community groups and uh, other organizations. And informal uh, covers what is left, interactions with friends, family and uh, colleagues. Now it's interesting because our um, reflex, immediate reflex would be to pay attention next time when we are having some meetings uh, in our family or with our friends to think, did I learn something from them? Did they say something new? Did I acquire a new knowledge or did I acquire a new skill? For example, just to give the shortest example is when you go to have fixed your car to uh, yeah, to the garage, to someone to fix your car. If you are watching, maybe you are learning how to uh, replace a bone if you are just watching the engineer over there, yeah? But to go uh, in depth 
apart from those uh, definitions, you see if we can uh, see the um, similar uh, common uh, things and the differences between formal, non-formal, informal by uh, thinking about the environment, for example. Yes, the environment, it's very easy in formal education. It's the classroom. In non-formal education, and here is the difference, even until now we have seen only similar points that it's organized, it has uh, learning objectives, it has an educational process, it has learning outcomes. It's that the learning setting uh, is casual. It can be, you, we can do uh, non-formal activities, non-formal learning activities in the garden, yeah? Uh, maybe we'll need some chairs because it's not all the time about uh, being actively involved in an activity. Non-formal education can mean also some uh, theoretical sessions or if you want, we can call it uh, this uh, traditional passive lectures. Someone say, ah, oh, but then it's not non-formal because it's not participatory. We don't have to imagine that in non-formal uh, learning all the time people are moving, yes, or they are doing an activity. No, they take the time also to reflect, to discuss, to analyze theories. About informal, I hope it, it was clear, yes, the, the environment uh, may occur in no matter when, no matter where, yeah. The content, uh, it's also interesting to see the difference between formal and non-formal because uh, for the formal, it's clear, it's the Ministry of Education most of the time providing some national curriculum based on the, yes, being primary gymnasium high school. Yeah, or so it's the teacher coming and uh, presenting the, the structure of the subject uh, he's uh, teaching or she is teaching. Yeah, so it's the, uh, we can say it's the top down uh, approach. Yes, related with the content in non-formal um, learning. We like to say that we try to um, identify the learning needs. It's true that it doesn't sound very uh, practical all the time because you say yes, but it takes lots of time. Yeah, when when you say you are uh, first you are, you are identifying the learning needs of your participants, of your students, of your students. Sometimes in in class, it's uh, it's difficult. Informal, we don't have this process of there is no content. Yeah. Uh, teaching learning methods. Teaching learning methods here, I can say that it's the part where the, the three of them can mix uh, very well. They, they can intermingle, yes, the formal methods with the non formal educational methods and even with the informal. Yeah. Now it's true that for the formal, uh, all the people are thinking about passive lectures. Ah, there is a teacher coming in front of uh, 25, 30 students and uh, he's just talking for 50 minutes. Mm. That it, again, I'm coming back, it's a stereotype. I know it's not at all uh, like that. There are more and more uh, teachers using lots of uh, participatory uh, methods, either that they learn from participating to, I don't know, some Erasmus Plus uh, trainings, yeah, that were encouraging uh, teachers to learn participative, interactive participative methods. Either they were all the time using these uh, active creative uh, methods, even in formal education. So I wouldn't do a separation here to say, yes, formal, it's only a passive traditional lecture. We can call it, if you want, stereotyping a bit boring and non-formal. It's all the time enjoyable and uh, involving, engaging the participants and the students, yeah? To informal, there is, uh, we don't talk about uh, methods because otherwise it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be informal. And we have the 
teaching evaluation tools. Here, there is a discussion to have because when talking about formal, um, there is, uh, there are all the credentials, there are the diplomas, the certificates recognized by the Ministry of uh, Education and sometimes also very important by the Ministry of uh, Labor, yes, of work that we can use if we want to apply for a job. Um, but on the other hand, for the non-formal education learning, uh, we don't have. And let's say this is a, there are these big discussions about the recognitions of the non-formal learning skills, knowledge or attitudes, yeah? I know there are, we are using some certificates um, in these European uh, projects, but for the moment, let's say that formally, uh, there is not um, recognition, fully recognition of the skills and knowledge uh, acquired on non-formal education context. Now, I wouldn't insist because more or less, I think we have done um, yeah, the, the exercise of understanding the differences between formal and non-formal, the differences and similarities, because it's not, let's say from the beginning, uh, we, we will not, let's not imagine there are two uh, competitors running to see who will get the first to the finish line. Now, uh, formal and non-formal, they are complementary, yes? So, um, I explained, I already said, when we say about methods, there are lots of non-formal methods, for example, if you want, used in, in schools. There are lots of teachers that we can call them uh, non-formal educators, even if they are um, in, in schools, yes? non-formal teachers. When I say non-formal teachers, it means they propose uh, more participatory uh, methods yes, during their, uh, their class. Now, um, the timing, we uh, haven't said anything, but in formal education, and I think this is mm, good to mention, it's a long-term yes, process. So uh, we start this formal education when we are uh, three years old. Uh, some, it's mandatory uh, in some countries still uh, 16, in some countries still uh, 18 years old, depending yeah, on, the, on the state. While the non-formal, most of the time it's a short cycle. So either it's seven days, either it's uh, 10 days. Sometimes there are more and more um, non-formal um, events organized for two months or uh, three months, yeah? Uh, you see here the content between, it is this difference between academic and uh, practical. Well, let's uh, be uh, also honest. It cannot be uh, all the time practical in uh, non-formal. Uh, it's true that we are, we have the time also to try it practically, but here mostly um, it's referring, and we will see uh, in a couple of minutes, to this part of experiential learning, yes, and maybe you already uh, are familiar with the David Kolb's uh, learning cycle that we we try an experience and we learn by experience yeah uh, this uh, here we make also the difference between the three of them uh, what is the approach the curriculum formation yes is it bottom up or top down it's let's say quite clear that in the formal uh, formal education it's a top-down curriculum formation, we already discussed. In non-formal, when we say it's there in the middle, negotiated curriculum, if, if you remember in a non-formal education uh, environment, we start with an icebreaker energizer, and after we have this session of um, uh, expectations, you know, fears, contributions. 
but apart from this, there are more and more people using um, questionnaires like one month or two months before uh, an event, a project, and uh, they try to identify the learning needs of the participants. So that's why we, we call it in non-formal education, we can say that it's this negotiated curriculum. Let's say we try as much as possible. Maybe there are still improvements to make, but at least even from the moment of preparing the agenda, the objectives, the activities, we try to ask the party, how would you like this to, to happen? For example, if they say we like to have uh, 20 minutes of uh, lecture and uh, breaks of uh, half an hour, everything is uh, negotiable. And informal, there is of course no uh, no curriculum. It's a conversational form. There is for talking about informal. Um, there were some people uh, talking about materials or the handouts or for example in a classroom um, you saw we, we put lots of um, uh, charts with different information or even on the outside in the school sometimes we see uh, uh, pictures of different uh, painters or writers is this informal because you just go outside so you are in a school but if you are reading what is written, uh, written on the walls, is that informal uh, learning or reading. Now about non-formal education, uh, you see uh, it provides uh, models, philosophies and techniques involving actively the participants, it's promoting this practical, flexible and uh, based on real needs, but we, ho we have already discussed about these characteristics of non-formal. Uh, it's good to know that in some countries the notion of non-formal education is not so used. They prefer, we'll hear a lot about community education, informal education, social pedagogy, or even, for uh, example, in, in uh, France, to, uh, no, they, they prefer their education populaire, which is also a concept hope they will not lose completely the values and the principles behind the education popular but it has some common part common points with the non-formal but in the same time it's also a new very interesting concept i was telling you about uh, david kolb's learning cycle and all the phases yes we should pass through an experience to reflection to uh, to arrive to this uh, abstract and concepts and after to uh, experience what we have learned. This is the learning cycle, the experiential learning cycle. It's very used in non-formal education and I'm pretty sure the educators, the teachers uh, familiar with non-formal education concept, they are using a lot. And the, the learning, it, it can start in any step. Even if we think that we should start from experience, actually we can start from the active experimentation. Yeah. And after to have a moment of reflection. And as you can see here, this experiential learning is um, directly related with what Hani and Mumford, I'm sure you also know, these uh, learning styles. Yeah, all of us, um, we have, we are either reflectors, we are either activists, we are either pragmatists, we are either theorists, yes, but at some point we have one of these uh, learning style that is predominant, yeah. And normally when we are preparing a non-formal uh, education uh, activity, we should um, think about some tools, some techniques in order to involve all these learning styles because in a group maybe you have 10 activists, maybe you have uh, four reflectors, uh, five theorists and some uh, pragmatics. So normally we prepare the activities according to, 
to this learning style. Normally, as I said in non-formal education, this is uh, how the educators, the trainers are, are working. Yeah. Um, I will not insist because I'm pretty sure um, that at least once in uh, until now, all of us, we have done this uh, test to see what we are. What is our uh, favorite learning style? Are we reflectors? Are we tourists? Yes. And this depends, you see, uh, depending on our favorite style, there are also um, methods that we can use. Yeah, what what can we propose for an activist as an activity? Yeah, we will not propose, for example, uh, readings. Readings, if you can see, if you are look, having a look at the tourists, we can propose readings for tourists and they will be very happy. But if we propose readings for activists, there it will not work the same. Now, after all this, um, technical about the, the three. Now, I said that uh, I will try to remember about the um, attention curve. Yes, remember, we start with our attention there at the highest level and after we go down until the moment that we are, our head is almost falling. Yes, and our eyes completely closed, in, especially in, in online, it's all the time a challenge to think how we can engage uh, people, how can we be sure that they are not um, doing something else, especially when you don't see your uh, participants, your students. Yeah, because it's it's good also, I, I will suggest you to, to look um, to the attention span. Yeah, there are lots of theories about the attention span and uh, how many minutes uh, the people can stay focused on a subject. And um, I, I've seen that uh, even they recommended that a presentation, a lecture, maybe should have the same length like uh, TED Talks, like almost 18 minutes. 18 minutes, they consider it the, the time that people can stay focused to a subject. Now, very quickly, there are some uh, methods that can be used also in uh, schools in formal context. They can be adapted. First is uh, the living library. Also in online can be used. It's a very nice exercise. It's true that maybe we will change the objectives, but as, as I was saying, we can adapt these, these methods, yes? So the, the people are becoming uh, books and we don't read books, we read people. And I imagine that we are doing this exercise in some breakout rooms online. We put each student to choose a title, to choose what kind of book he or she would like to be. And uh, after to, to tell the story of his or her book, Yes, so mm, you see in a in-person face-to-face context, it's absolutely, I, I hope you participated already to some uh, living libraries, but even in online, we can imagine in the five books, people with descriptions and talk about uh, themselves. The World Cafe, it's, um, a method to make people feel uh, more comfortable during the meetings. For example, uh, either in online, uh, the suggestions that we can make for the students, for example, if we have a 50 minutes lecture, we can tell them it's okay to have a tea next to you. It's okay to have some cookies next to you. Uh, I don't know, maybe we can decide with them, but uh, have a cookie, but maybe uh, when you are eating, please turn off your camera. This depends the level of uh, how open we are during these meetings. But the World Cafe, the objective uh, make people feel uh, good, comfortable, they discuss.
organized and I have seen uh, more and more events also in this format the World Cafe organized the uh, online uh, World Cafes. Of course that when this period will be finished, I hope we'll be all invited to World Cafes where I think the biggest one that I participated was uh, uh, nine. 84 people, yes, with uh, lots of tables. We have discussed like it was six hours. Uh, and the principle that of the World Cafe, we can also use it. Uh, because you see why people, they say non-formal education, it's uh, only about uh, playing. You see, we have here some guidelines like have fun. Mm. Well, you see, why having fun, but learning, it's also, uh, as I said, to to make people uh, engage. Either we should propose enjoyable uh, activities, either we should motivate them intrinsically, so or they should be very interested about the content. It's, it's not so easy to find methods to motivate them. Yeah, so here see with the, the contributions of the participants, so uh, it's not only one person talking, it's uh, equal chances, yeah, everyone has to express uh, uh, to the, on the subject of this. There are also concepts uh, that we can use to any uh, non-formal activity that we organize, even they are specific to the World Cup. Yeah? encouraging the participation, listening, active listening, sharing collectively. Uh, even if we think that it's difficult to do it online, mm, yes and no. And we'll have a, at the end a short discussion also about the mostly. There are lots of activities that were transferred to online successfully. It's true that we also have to know the limits of the online, and there are many. Uh, this is uh, Eduardo De Bono, but uh, everybody knows the six thinking heads. It's absolutely ing incredible for uh, for discussions on different topic, and we ask people to put heads on. Uh, what is very nice in online, we tried. And if you know, there is this uh, option where you can um, attach to yourself different, uh, yeah, you can put glasses, hats, and the people when we have done it in a breakout room, they could choose the, um, the hat and they wear it during the discussion. And for, how do you say, for the teenagers, this was amazing because they took the time also to figure it out how they, the color, uh, hat, yes, what does it mean a, gray, a green hat? That will be back to the uh, online learning because we are, I put online with a question mark. The learning is not online, the, <laughs> the setting, the space we are using is online. Our learning remains, yes, the cognitive is still in our uh, heads. Until we will arrive to this moment, I wouldn't like to imagine this time, but for the moment, our cloud, it's still uh, our brain, yes, here in our heads. So the, the characteristics in online, more or less, the space, the people, the process, they stay the same. It's true that the, the, uh, the control that we have, it's limited, especially we, with the groups. We don't know what is happening behind the, the screen. We cannot see, we cannot interfere all the time. We are still working with some people. It's true that it's more strange sometimes in front of a computer all by ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and but the process also remains the same. We uh, set up the learning objectives, uh, the content, what content we want to transmit, uh, how can we engage our students. Yeah. Yeah. I was saying lots of time about 
this motivation, yeah, uh, how we should keep people uh, motivated yeah? to think around us. Normally, uh, they, they are uh, when we are on internet, they calculate it and they say that. We change the um, internet page at every eight seconds. We arrive to this performance that our attention span arrived to uh, eight seconds. And Microsoft saying that um, and then humans. for a newspaper we shouldn't believe everything it's true it was uh, in uh, time magazine uh, then it was also another article explaining that uh, you how can you measure the attention span for a fishbowl it's not simple yeah so here uh, you have seen that uh, to keep people um, focused you have to think about methods how to keep them um, concentrated and um, it's not only about it's true that uh, we can have these uh, traditional uh, passive lectures yeah when we talk when we present i would uh, advise uh, that we take in consideration the, the attention curve that we mentioned at the beginning, the one with the 20 minutes uh, attention that we can dedicate to any presentation. And uh, thanks to the lots of application and platforms that are now available, I think we can make uh, small breaks, small quizzes, small games, but in the same time, I, I didn't talk a lot about uh, synchronous and asynchronous activities because we can keep people on the screen for 50 minutes or one hour. But at the same time, we can propose them to turn off their computer and be back in a hours with the task uh, done. Yeah. Uh, we, there, there are, I, I have seen uh, many teachers using these uh, task oriented uh, projects. They had a meeting 20 minutes, 30 minutes with uh, the students explaining the, the task. And um, after having a meeting in two In this three hours uh, in school, just in front of the of the computer. Now here, I I, I have just put some uh, platforms that I'm, I'm completely sure that you are using. With what have we replaced the flip chart or the the whiteboard in the classroom? They also, they gave name. I uh, if you have used. We use the Jamboard or the open board or the uh, yes, the, the Miro. I think as far as I heard, there are many teachers using uh, Miro. But apart from these uh, platforms that are trying to replace some instruments that we were using either in formal education, traditional, uh, traditional, in the face to face one, in person one, yes or in the non-formal because all, also all the activities from the non-formal education were transferred in uh, online for the moment. I know everybody is missing his things and the gatherings and to see the people and to talk with the people face to face. Maybe there will not be uh, so much time to wait, but for the moment, it's good that we have this online it's hard to imagine what would have happened without these uh, opportunities, without having all these gadgets. And 
except from these platforms, you can see that I put all the uh, products offered by uh, Google. Let's say, I know maybe there are, if there are some people that are not uh, fans, supporters of Google, I can understand. There are some people not using at all Google and uh, I can see, uh, I can understand also why, yeah, people with value, different values. But uh, just to tell you that Google has um, 84 products uh, available either for the private personal uh, life, either for a uh, professional. So 84. So I'm pretty sure most of us, we have an email on uh, Gmail, but after there are all the other uh, products that we can use. Some of them uh, I'm sure you are already using, for example, apart from the email, the Jamboard you are all using, the calendar maybe you are all using, but there are all, all the others. I have put it here, if you can imagine, and I counted, I invite you to do also this exercise. How many of these products can you use in your uh, educational activities, being formal or being uh, non-formal? I uh, counted, for example, for uh, some non-formal activities and I discovered 23, 23 products from Google that can uh, fit very well to different uh, activities that we can propose in non-formal uh, education. Yeah, um, I put it all of them here. Apart from that, I put also other platforms or applications that I hope and I'm sure some of you are using. For example, Mentimeter. Um, I have an exercise on Mentimeter. Uh, I don't know if we'll have the time to use it. It will not take so much time. Mm, I can propose to use it like this. We can see Mentimeter. It's also there are these uh, apps that you can um, test either the level of energy of your participants. So when you are having a lecture, you say we stop, you can make graphics and people can say what is your level of energy right now? And on Mentimeter, you can build this graphic uh, from one to five. And you will see also how many people are uh, responding, are acting. Because maybe you, you see there uh, 25 participants, but in the end, when you are asking a question or when you are giving a task, you will see there are only five reactions. So these platforms are also, and this is how I use most of them, to test or to even to interrupt some uh, uh, theoretical or too theoretical uh, lecture. And in the same time to test the level of energy, it's good not only the level of energy, it's good to ask people from time to time, uh, how do they feel, if everything is all right, if they are hungry, if they are thirsty. Yeah? These are also aspects, even if it sounds a bit, why should we? Yes, we are working with people, yes, being offline, being online, being uh, blended learning, and we talked about synchronous asynchronous, different activities. And, uh, just I would like to suggest here uh, from the platforms, it's not like I, let's say I rediscovered uh, Google Earth, not in the sense that you can go and uh, see any place on this uh, world, on Google Earth, but there is an option there. I don't know, maybe some, uh, I'm, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the, all the geography features are using Google. There is the option where you can make absolutely wonderful presentation or even the history teachers, yes, using this Google Earth. And there is this option, it's called exactly like that, uh, projects. You go, you add presentations, and after when you present, it's not just like slides moving, but when you are presenting your work, it's the earth moving and the it's captivating. Let's say it's a way 
to keep uh, also students engaged when they are doing their task, but also to keep the, um, the viewers, the audience uh, engaged and curious. Uh, I've tried then, uh, it was not the subject, but maybe for the time, for the next time, I will try to use this Google Earth presentation and we'll move from place to place yeah, to present different concepts. I think it can be used. I, I just mentioned geography or history teachers, but uh, I imagine even uh, physics or chemistry just to, to show the students some inventions where they uh, they appeared, yes, or where that person lived. And you go on Google Earth and people, we travel together, yeah. The, from the old platforms that uh, I have tried, this is the one that I rediscovered. Let's say it's a classic, but we talked a lot. We talked a lot about the, the classics today. Um, we will not go on Mentimeter uh, anymore. I hope you are uh, familiar with um, with that platform. But we will um, we will end. Uh, we will uh, finish thinking um, from uh, the shoes of the educator of the teacher. Yes, uh, what is for us authentic learning? Uh, also to ask ourselves, how would you like, would I like a learning environment, a learning process to happen? What it would be for me enjoyable? What it would be for me intrinsically motivating? Yes, what could keep me focused? But we can do the exercise thinking either wearing different hats from the six thinking hats, either thinking about the, um, the four learning styles yes, that we have seen, the reflector, the activist, the pragmatist, or the theorists. Yes, so to try to put ourselves in uh, the different uh, learning uh, style shoes. And when we uh, build uh, our um, learning educational uh, activity, to try to keep in mind and to consider all, all this. Now, I, I loved the, this, what it was uh, about learning currently, and uh, I think it's, it's true, but in the same time can be a very good uh, statement uh, to discuss using the six thinking hats. Yeah, probably no one is currently learning at the level, intensity and needed speed to cope with the complexity of the modern world. So uh, things are moving really fast and uh, it's not easy to, to keep the pace. Either we are students, either uh, we, are, um, we are teachers. Now there are some references here. Uh, I put some, some are very, uh, the, the classics, I'm sure you, you know it. To, to finish the, I, I would put the presentation in the traditional traditional lecture. Yeah, it was not. There is this also concept of active learning, very nice, but it was not today. So we were not so active, but still. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will not test the large. Thank you very much, Marian. Um, thank you very much for the useful and inspiring presentation. Uh, uh, I'm sure all the participants find, found the resources you shared very, very useful and the presentation was very informative. Um, now, if you are available, yes, I would leave uh, maybe time for one or two questions since we had the uh, uh, questions in the chat. Ah. I hope you can uh, hear me. Yes. OK, that's great because I lost you for a second. So uh, actually we had a comment that leads to a question. I'm gonna read it out loud for you. 
And the comment was, I think it is good that you talked about the complementarity. Sometimes formal learning is seen as bad, boring, rigid when compared to non-formal. I'm not sure this is true. Non-formal learning can be very structured with a plan like sport coaching. And the question is, how do you think the attitude of policymakers could be changed to appreciate this complementarity? Ah, it's uh, good uh, that we bring in discussion the policy makers because they have uh, an important role, especially in the recognition, as we were saying, of the skills, uh, knowledge that we acquire in non-formal context. Most of them, they are aware, and I met lots, but there was still, um, let's say, mostly a formal, some of them took part and they have done um, Erasmus projects, but in the shoes of a student. So it, it was not completely the non-formal context. They haven't participated in uh, youth projects, action projects. But why not inviting them more and more and insisting on them to participate to our non-formal uh, activities? I have seen even teachers that organize uh, non-formal activities. For example, the World Cafe, um, per se, it's an event where uh, the policy makers are invited in order for them to be aware of the results of the discussions. Yeah, so I think we, we should insist on inviting them to our uh, activities. Otherwise, maybe they will continue to neglect Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marian. And we had another question. What tools or formats would you recommend for measuring the outcomes of non-formal learning education? Do you have any example that you can point to? To measure the outcomes? outcomes I, yeah. Yes. Uh, also in formal and non-formal, uh, the, there is a platform some people are using for a couple of years, some people are, are just discovering Socrative. I think you all know Socrative uh, platform is uh, Socrative.com. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, some of you already using. Uh, if not in non-formal context, you know there we put uh, the accent on uh, the self-evaluation, which is important in the same time you learn how to self-evaluate uh, yourself. And uh, if not for the knowledge, let's say we use these um, non-formal tools like uh, quizzes and we have already seen some, um, some platforms that are very uh, useful for evaluating the outcomes in non-formal learning. Otherwise, even there are some people using a practical, uh, why not uh, practical um, exercises at the end. Yeah, thank you for replying. And we have one last question for you. The question is, the sport programs and adult adult education courses can be a part of non-formal learning? Uh, they are. I didn't mention at all and uh, or maybe I mentioned uh, once the lifelong learning concept because then then the discussion would have gone even farther. It's interesting. There are other concepts that we didn't touch. But it's true, adult education, non-formal education is part of this big concept, lifelong learning, yes, that we are all part involved in. And uh, it is structured as much as uh, possible. Uh, and it's true, adult uh, education, also we didn't talk the, the classics, maybe you have seen this concept of uh, andragogy, yes? It's a... Uh, an old uh, concept. But uh, yes, we can consider it non-formal education. OK, thank you very much. Um, there are no more questions, I think, but we, we had a, lo a lot of positive comments uh, in the chat. 
So please feel free also to have a look at the chat uh, in case you want to, to read them. And thank you for covering this topic in such a broad and detailed way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, staying with, uh, with us. It's not easy, I know, in front of the screens <laughs> and no. the effort, the effort of participating should be appreciated. And I yeah. really appreciate everyone who succeeds to stay in front of the screens for this time. Thank you. Thank you very much to you, actually. And uh, before leaving, I would like to point out two practical um, questions very important for the audience. Uh, please do not forget to complete the feedback form. My colleague Eleonora will post the link uh, in the chat. And please remember that no certificates will be issued for, uh, for this webinar today. Thank you all uh, again for participating. Thank you, Marian, for the excellent presentation. And I wish you all a good evening and stay safe. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks.